people call you a monster too. Why not kill them? Because then I am what they say I am. Congratulations on the show. So many amazing things happen and we want to break it down for our fans. So can you just walk me through Geralt's journey in a few sentences? Geralt is in essence a super soldier with no political lean who's designed to kill monsters. So existing in a world like that, you're going to end up being a bit of a pariah. It's a, a bit of a dark world. It's a world which people do live in fear and there are reflections of xenophobia to say the very least. And he is a guy who has created this hard, cold exterior because that's what his head is telling him to be. And that is, that is his best way of surviving. On the inside though, he's someone who very much believes in the chance of a better world and is a bit of a white knight despite his head telling him otherwise. What I love about this show is there's a lot of physicality yes. for your character in both the love scenes and in the fighting scenes. So, Geralt, I have to ask, which is the lesser evil? The sword fighting or the love scenes? Evil is evil, I'm afraid. I can't help you there. Both, but there is no such thing as a lesser evil, despite what the show says, and you will discover <laughs> in time. <laughs> in the love scenes, the bathtub scene went absolutely viral on the internet. Did you expect that type of reaction from fans? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the games as well, and the bathtub scene is a massive piece of the games. And so, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I knew what was happening when it was happening. I was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> Like, I don't know if they know, but it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. You were like, were you like waiting on Twitter yeah. for it to blow up? That's amazing. And as far as the sword fighting goes, the fights are just so epic. What is like the training that you had to go through for that? Um, <clears throat> the training, specifically episode one, which uh, we shot in reshoots. Uh, Wolfgang Stegemann, um and I, we were friends from Mission Impossible. I convinced uh, the showrunner, the producers to bring him on to help design this fight. And he, his team and I spent hours and hours and hours designing this fight and running over things and, and making sure that the most important thing happened, which was despite a spectacular fight, that was secondary to the story. The story had to be traveled through the fight and my character had to exist within the action. It's not just gonna be a piece where you see some cool sword stuff and a spell or two and then you're like, and we're done and then you get back to storytelling, it had to enhance the storytelling. And that was my favorite piece about working with Wolfie and his team, is that every move meant something. Every move was deliberately placed to be part of this storytelling. And you see a massive contrast between the first half of the fight and the second half of the fight. Mm -hmm. And then you see similarities between the first half of the fight and the very end of the second half. And this was all about having the character be reflected, if not through dialogue, then definitely through action. Yeah, well, you guys pulled it off. I have to ask my last question. Black Adam is in production. Mm -hmm. We know he has a history with Superman. Right. Would you want to face off against The Rock? <laughs> I, I know Dwayne, and, and I know this people at Seven Bucks, obviously, and we have the same manager. And uh, I think to have the opportunity to do that and to continue telling a Superman story would be a lot of fun. He's a big guy, though. He's Can a really big right guy. Now on camera? No, let's not call him out. We don't do that. I'll call him afterwards. Like, come on then, big guy. <laughs> Arm wrestle. Yennefer, imagine the most powerful woman in the world. Do you have what it takes? Can you walk us through your character's journeys in the show? Absolutely. Um, I am a so I play Yennefer, a Fengerberg, and she's a sorceress. She she has elven blood, so she's got magical powers. She doesn't know that at the beginning. We meet her at 14, and we go on a journey with her up to the age of, you know, to, in her late, in, she's about 77, into her late 70s. And um, we see her discover, we just see her discover her powers and um, figure out where her powers lie and what they mean to her. Um, she, uh, we, she comes from quite a tragic childhood, and she's quite insecure about about love and being loved and and what that means for her. And so we, I think, her ultimate goal is to find a true connection and and a and um an unconditional love. Um, we and, and ultimately that fe feeds her powers. She becomes one of the most powerful mages on the continent. Yeah, and so Siri is. Uh the princess of Sintra, 
Um, she also has powers that she discovers she has. She's very stubborn, very feisty, and she's very, very curious. She wants to be involved with what everyone else is doing around her. And then she's suddenly thrown into this brutal world and she has to um, open her mind to different perspectives um, and, uh, you know, seeing things from other people's points of view. And I think that allows her to adapt and um, and develop herself. And she's constantly discovering things um, about her family, about people, about the world. And, um, and I think the brutality of the world is what allows her to build this sort of shell and detach herself from the suffering that she is going through, which ultimately allows her to kind of continue on. She's very, very determined, um, but it means that she she's a very different character from the start to the end because she, she builds so much knowledge and experience and she sees things she had never seen before. Oh, I can't wait to see the end of it. I love this show. One of my favorite parts in the show is Yennefer's glow up. She goes through this huge physical transformation. So I wanted to know, how did that impact your performance? When she's transformed, um, yeah, she sacrifices a lot in that moment. So that definitely, um, that feeds the rest of, you know, you know all her um, decisions from that moment on and, and choices she makes because of that moment. Um, it's such a, it's such a turning point for Yennefer in the whole series. Um, yeah, and um, yeah. And there's a season two, so congratulations on that. What storylines would you guys like to see your characters explore in season two? I just want to do some fighting. I just, I just really want to do some stunts. That's what I'm excited for. Yeah, I want to do more stunts as well. Um, I hopefully meet Syria. I don't know what's going to happen in season yeah. two, but... fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. I thought you'd have fangs or horns or something. I had them filed down. <laughs> the Witcher universe is so vast. There's video games, there's books. What do people need to know before watching this series? Nothing. Um, I want people to be able to come into the series and fall in love with it for what's on the screen. Part of my big goal in adapting this was to make sure that we were honoring the books. I mean, that's hopefully what people, when people are coming to the project, if they're familiar with it, they know that there are books. <laughs> um, that's what we're really trying to keep the soul and the spirit of. But we know that there are video game fans. We know that there are comic book fans. We know that there are cosplaying fans. I mean, people love this franchise. We wanted to be able to keep them interested and keep them surprised, but also make sure that we are leaving room for people to also come in and discover um, the show in the first place. So we don't start out, you don't need to know anything about the world of The Witcher. Um, come in, sit back, relax, enjoy. It's, I think it's a pretty exciting ride no matter what you know. I'm excited for people to see it. And that Henry Cavill is a Witcher, right? I know yeah. he's been <laughs> very open about really wanting this role. So how did you go about casting him for Geralt? And what did he do to convince you that he was a perfect person for the job? Um, he called Netflix a lot once he learned that we were making The Witcher as a series. Um, and I sat down with him very early in the process. It was, um, it was in April. We hadn't even started writing scripts yet. We had nothing. Um, and I sat down with him and he had watched all the video games. When I told him that they were based on books, he went, out. He bought all the books. He read them all through. Um, but at the same time, I just said to him, we're not, I'm so glad that you're passionate and excited. We're not there yet. Um, I called him again about four months later, and I had met 207 other people who were interested in playing Geralt. And the truth is, by then, we had all of the scripts. And I had been writing, the other writers had been writing, and really, Henry's voice had never left my head. And it took me a while to sort of realize that. And I was like, oh, that's what I've been doing. Um, and we sat down along with Alex Sakharov, the director, and Sophie Holland, our casting director. Um, we all sat down in New York and we talked for hours. And we talked about who his Geralt would be and how it differed from the games and what he had learned from the books and what he was starting to see in the scripts. And we talked about his hair color and his eye color. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to wear a wig. He wanted to grow his own hair out and dye it white. And of course, you know, we all were like, oh my God, your hair will fall out. You can't do that. <laughs> um, uh, but we kind of delved in deep that second meeting. And when I left the room that day, I knew we had found him. Wow, Lauren, that's a fascinating story. It's funny you mentioned his voice every time he says, hmm, in the show. <laughs> yes, yes, you are the witcher. Yes. You, um, you know, you have a unique approach to storytelling and there's a lot of mythology in the story. So can you kind of talk to us about that and walk us through all the different timelines in the show? Yeah, so um, the timelines really came out of necessity. 
honestly. Um, I knew that I wanted to tell the short stories that are present in The Last Wish and Sword of Destiny. Um, the Last Wish was the first book that I read. I absolutely fell in love with it. And to me, it's really the foundation of the world of The Witcher. That's when you meet Geralt and that's when you meet a bunch of the monsters and you sort of see his, his mantra as he walks through the world. Um, but those books were missing something for me, which were Yennefer and Ciri playing really big roles. Um, and to me, a character is only as interesting as the other people that he comes into conflict with or comes into love with. Um, so I knew I wanted them to be a bigger piece of the series. However, if I wanted to tell the short stories, Ciri's not alive during those short stories. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I had to start to play with time. Um, and I had just seen um, Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. And I came out of the theater and I was thinking about the timelines of that show because it tells three separate stories. One of them takes about a month, one takes about a week, one takes about a day. Mm -hmm. And yet they're told interspersed. And in an interview, Christopher Nolan was saying, if I told them in time order, you would think that the, the mission that took a day was the least important and the mission that took a month was the most important because that's what screen time tells you. Mm -hmm. And he's like, but they were all three important. And I hopped out of the shower one morning and I said to my husband, am I insane? Could we do those type of timelines in this show? And would people understand? And would I have to explain it all? Do I need chirons at the bottom of the screen? Um, it was the first time that I really thought, oh my God, here's how we could tell the stories that'll be surprising to people and also be able to show sides of characters that we wouldn't otherwise get to see. And it was challenging at times. I mean, we have huge timelines in the writer's room to sort of track how old everyone is and time that has passed. Um, but I think it's a really fun way to tell the story. Yeah, and it's a lot of math. That's so cool that Christopher Nolan had an influence on that. Absolutely. I mean, it was a, it, it really was. I Reading that interview with him was changed everything for The Witcher. For some of our fans that don't know anything about The Witcher, can you give us sort of like a mini synopsis about what the show's about? Sure. So um, Geralt, who is The Witcher, um, he's a monster hunter. And when we meet him in the series, he is several decades old already. He's been doing this his whole life. It's all he knows to do. It's what he thinks he's meant to do. I don't even know that he loves it that much, but it's what he's good at. So it's what he continues to go back to. And basically, I wanted to put him on a path and then mess that path up, which is where Siri and Yennefer enter the picture. And we're sort of tracking this broken family that is coming together. None of them think they need each other. They're all kind of orphans in the world living on the margins of society and that they're destined to be together. You take that sort of family story and then you add in monsters and magic and some war and some sex and you've got The Witcher. <laughs> Just that. You mentioned <laughs> monsters, which happens to be my favorite part of the show. What monster were you excited to see come to life on screen? Uh, so many of them, um, but really the Striga was the, the most sort of interesting, I think, to adapt. And the one that I felt like we absolutely had to. And it's because the Striga isn't really a monster. She's a cursed little girl. Um, she's re wreaking havoc on a city. She is decimating people, killing them, disemboweling them. It's awful. And Geralt is called in to solve the problem. And you honestly think he's, he's a little like pest control, that he's gonna come in and kill this monster and then the town will be happy. And what you discover actually is that the monster is a cursed little girl and she's doing this out of instinct, not because she wants to. And in that moment, Geralt makes a decision to save her instead of kill her. Um, that's what he is, that's what his goal is. And I think it's a really interesting way to sort of look at the, what I would say is the overarching theme of our series, which is, you know, sometimes the monsters aren't the ones that you think they are. And the humans that are against this little girl, they're actually the more monstrous ones in the story. I love those themes. If only pest control looked like Henry Cavill. I know, right? <laughs> Call Orkin all the time.